We've got the goods today, folks. We finally have the emails from Fauci and Collins and all the other people inside the government as they were discussing the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that leads to COVID, the disease. These are explosive. I'm taking, I think, big risks bringing these to you in such a public way, although they'll be out everywhere soon, I hope, because this is really big news. I mean, what if, what if it could be shown that this virus did come from a lab and that certain individuals inside the United States, also virologists from all over the world, circled the wagons to obfuscate that, hide it, maybe just because they were worried about professionally where they're gonna get new lab grants or maybe people would suddenly decide, maybe we shouldn't like give virologists all that money after all to do the things they've been doing because it looks like there's a possibility that this came out of a lab. Today, we're gonna go into those emails. Let's take a look at this, this is really explosive. I covered this a long time ago, but today we're gonna to look at this new trove of Fauci emails. Many of these I only saw in redacted form. Now, thanks to a long FOIA fight from Jimmy Tobias down there at James C. Tobias on Twitter, I just received a bunch of new unredacted emails. He writes detailing the February 1st, 2020 teleconference between Dr. Fauci and virologists discussing SARS-CoV-2. This is the source of it. You can see the link down there, and this is what it looks like. I'm here on page three, where the emails start. You can see Christian G. Anderson, a virologist at Scripp Institute, writing to Fauci and Jeremy Farrar and Eddie Holmes and all these other people. We'll get into who those are, but that's what it looked like. Not a lot interesting going on in this particular email. Before I move any further, though, this is not a left-right kind of a story. I don't care about left-right. I want to know, are we working with people who have high integrity or low integrity? Are we working with, frankly, good people or evil people? This is what I actually care about, and I do up-down. So if this feels left-right to you or it feels like I'm attacking somebody, I'm only attacking those who fall to the bottom of this chart. I don't care about left-right. You can find people on the left and the right who are on the bottom of the chart and people on the left and the right who are on the top of the chart. So let's go for a good old integrity. This is where it started for me um, way back, yeah, right here. On June 4th, 2021, I went through a lot of the Fauci emails in a lab leak cover-up. So you can look at that episode if you want. Um, it, it's, I really stand by it. It was great investigative reporting at the time. By the way, any senators, any congressional people holding hearings, any journalists want to reach out, I'm right here. You can reach me very easily. Just uh, kick an email out to support at peakprosperity.com. It'll get to me, and then uh, we can go from there because here's the goods. Let's go into it. Um, so the time frame in question we want to look at is between January 31st and February 9th. 2020. Okay. And so these are some of the things that we saw back then, right? Remember, this is a famous email from Christian Anderson on January 31st, 2020. Remember very early on in this pandemic, kicking it out to Tony Fauci saying, hi, Tony. So obviously very familiar with each other. He said in yellow, the unusual features of the virus make up a really small part of the genome, less than 0.1%, which is an irrelevant number, by the way, so one has to look really closely at all the sequences to see that some of the features potentially look engineered. So that's what you see when you take a first glance at this virus. That's what I saw, that's what we all saw, and we're gonna take a closer look at that because it's really important. He's not wrong, but that was where he was on January 31st. We are going to see that in just four days, Christian Anderson completely flipped his story and without a shred of intervening data. So let's look at this, or at least not conclusive data. Let me put it that way. And he writes down further, Eddie, Bob, Mike, myself, um, all find the genome inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory. Fancy way of saying, this thing doesn't look like it came from nature. And it really doesn't, we all know that now. So um, by the way, at the time, this is what I was working with when I was like decoding all of that for you for y'all back in 2021. Here's a email from Ram, R-A-M, Aran Fouchier out of, he's um, out of Rotterdam. At any rate, it was like, dear Jeremy and others, this was a very useful teleconference. Redacted, redacted, redacted. Thanks for organizing this on such short notice. I was dying to know what is hiding out behind that B5 redaction. Uh, here's the notes he took of the meeting. I was like, that's not helpful. And at the time, I would get things like this, a lovely reply to Ron's big notes there. Thanks, Ron. Gray, 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 gray. That's from Jeremy Farrar, who was 
and still is at the time, he is the head of the Wellcome Trust, a, not, a very well-funded but non-governmental organization that is, was brought in instantly into the inner workings of this whole crew, this cabal, if I could say. Now, now we finally have unredacted emails. Here's an example of one. This is to Jeremy Farrar, comes from Anthony Fauci. It's copying in Christian Anderson and some other people at the NIH, NAAD. This is on February 1st, Tony Fauci writing, Jeremy, I just got off the phone with Christian Anderson. And he related to me his concern about the furin, not furin, uh, that's got an extra E on the end, the furin cleavage, the furin site mutation, which is the cleavage site, in the spike protein of the currently circulating 2019 NCOV, wasn't called COVID back then, continuing, quote, I told him that as soon as possible, he and Eddie Holmes, another virologist, this time out of Australia, should get a group of evolutionary biologists together to examine carefully the data to determine if his concerns are validated. So that's February 1st, Saturday, early in the morning. I guess that's late Friday night. So um, what they're really talking about here is like, gosh, you know, quote, I would imagine that in the United States, if this would be the FBI, it would get report, if this is true, we would report it to them. And in the UK, that would be MI5. Um, so Tony Fauci saying, gosh, if this looks like it was lab created, maybe we got to get the FBI involved. I'm not sure why that's an FBI matter, to be honest. FBI is a domestic organization. Tony Fauci's been around the block long enough to understand that. That would be an international sort of a thing. That would be State Department. That would be very high level federal government international side of things. So I'm not really clear why he thought if this thing was lab created that uh, that was a, a matter for the FBI to investigate unless there were domestic people involved who the FBI would then say, hey, were you all involved in creating a global pandemic, wiping out trillions and trillions of dollars of global GDP, potentially leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people? Maybe the FBI would want to get involved. I still think there's a chance for that here, to be honest, if we lived in a fair country that was really going to follow the evidence. There's some people who ought to be answering some questions. I'm going to show you that right now. So here's an example of a missing email that I didn't have last year, all redacted. Jeremy Farrar writing this Sunday, February 2nd. So now we're right in the thick of this whole thing. Oddly, for anybody who is looking into this, I have the complete trove of emails that were just released, and I have the old trove. This one is missing, and I'm, I'd be curious to see what this one is. So a little, little bit of a uh, poke there for anybody who's doing an investigation deeper into this. This one right here, it starts, this is a very complex issue. I will do what? I'd like to know. Anyway, I couldn't find this email, but all the rest we're going to cover. We're going to cover this one, which is the smoking gun email. This is it. It's from Jeremy Farrar. Notice we got an attention here to Anthony Fauci. Also, Patrick Valence, he's out of the UK. Christian Drosten, um, he is German virologist. We got Marion Koopsman there, Dutch virologist. R.A.M. Fouchier, also a Dutch virologist. Eddie Holmes from Australia. Andrew Rambeau, Christian Anderson. Those are both virologists. Paul Schreier out of the Wellcome Trust. Mike Ferguson out of Wellcome Trust. Francis Collins all the way down there, director of the NIH at that moment in time. And the NIH oversees the NIAID where Fauci is inserted. So Collins is technically one layer higher there. Uh, Josie Golding and that Josie is also from the Wellcome Trust. So that's who everybody's in here. Jeremy Farrar copying and a lot of his co-workers at the Wellcome Trust, as well as a bunch of virologists from all around the globe, plus the two key stakeholders at the NIH and the NIAID. What happened here? What does he say? He says, thank you everyone for joining. There is clearly much to understand in this. This call was very helpful to hear some of our current understanding and the many gaps in our knowledge. And this was all redacted at the time I got it in 2021. Now it's unredacted. Thank you to everyone for joining. That part in yellow I just read because that was the beginning of the email and everything that's below that yellow part was redacted. He writes here, <clears throat> I do not believe this is a question of binary outcome. It's more a question of what are the evolutionary origins of 2019 NCOV important for future risk assessment and understanding of animal human coronaviruses. You know what? That's okay. There's still obviously some gray zone. They're not really sure. 
he's Jeremy is at least saying, you know, what would be really cool is if we could figure out where this came from, that will help us make it not happen again, obviously, right? But he's writing it very diplomatically, which is like, look, if this came out of a lab, maybe we should know that so we could stop this from happening again. Uh, he writes, I do not know. I mean, I do know that there are papers being prepared. There will be media interest and there is already chat on Twitter and WeChat. In green, we on this call are not the only ones with scientific expertise in this area. And this was an ad hoc group that came together to air some thoughts. It's clearly not the sole group to take this forward. That will need a broader range of input and a respected international body to ask an expert group to explore this with a completely open mind. In order to stay ahead of conspiracy theories and social media, I do think there's an urgency for a body to convene such a group. Da, 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 da. So um, <clears throat> what's happening here? So, hey, it's just an ad hoc group. After this was over, all the statements said experts agree. All the top leading virologists were, were consulted. I can show you that these virologists are not the leading ones in this particular field. In fact, notably, the actual people I would have had on this if I was at all concerned on these con calls, if I was at all concerned with finding out how this coronavirus came out, are missing from these. So investigative journalism and, and looking into things and reporting like I do from time to time is both a question of what's there and what's not there. The negative space sometimes tell you more, tells you more than the positive space. So, um, but they said, hey, you know, he's like J Jeremy saying, you know, well, we, we may not we may not know everything. And we've convened just an ad hoc group. It isn't necessarily consensus. It isn't necessarily all the experts, although it was presented like that after the fact. So this is still February 1st. Let's go down. Um, so here are some more reflections from the meeting. So Farrar said, hey, February 2nd. He's like, thank you. Some thoughts overnight from others. Gray. That's what it was in 2021. Thanks to the FOIA, now we can say some thoughts overnight from others. He wrote here on February 2nd. On a spectrum of zero is nature and 100 is a lab release, I'm honestly at 50. My guess is that this will remain gray unless there's access to the Wuhan lab, and I suspect that's unlikely. And his suspicion was absolutely correct. But notice here on February 2nd, Jeremy Farrar, after all, I can show you, there were, I'm skipping dozens and dozens of emails, back and forth, lots of discussion. But as of February 2nd, he's like, 50-50? I don't really know. Uh, writing down there, uh, he says, from Mike Ferzan, who was the discoverer of the SARS receptor. So Mike Ferzan, missing from these emails, but this is something that Jeremy Farrar thought, hey, I should go talk to Mike, because Mike is actually pretty respected. He is the discoverers of the SARS receptor. Notice here who Jeremy is sharing this very private, very confidential email with at this moment, just to Francis Collins, just to Anthony Fauci, and Anthony Fauci's right-hand man, Lawrence Tabak. Okay, so that's it. He isn't like, like, he isn't copying in the rest of the world on this. This is just between the head of the Wellcome Trust and the top individuals at the NIH and the NIAID. That's it. That's the only people who are gonna see this particular email until you and me get to look at it now. <clears throat> so, Mike Frazan said, hey, the receptor binding domain, that's RBD, didn't look engineered to him as in, no human would have selected the individual mutations and cloned them into the RBD. I think we all agree, end quote. Actually though, a human might not have done that. And even a computer program designed by human might not have done that. But a human using cell lines and animal models and letting those animal models and cell lines computationally work this out, they might have created that particular RBD. So that wasn't ruled out here. It's just like Mike Farzan said, I'm not, I don't think a human would have done that that way. That's fine, but let's carry on. However, number two in that list was Tissue culture passage can often lead to gain of basic sites, including furin cleavage sites. This is the stuff that we've already seen with human coronaviruses. So this was a known fact. Remember, I brought you the furin cleavage site long time ago. And at the time, though, you're like, oh, that's crazy talk. Uh, those come from all sorts of places. Actually, they don't. 
there aren't that many furin cleavage sites, and this one in particular, with the genetic code that it encodes for it, we actually see that genetic code only one place in the entire genome library that's not in a bacteria. And by the way, bacteria have nothing to do with mammals and all that. And that one place is in a Moderna patent from 2016. All right, so carrying on. Three, he says, Mike Verzon, he, Mike Verzon, is bothered by the furin site and has a hard time explaining that is an event outside the lab. Now, there are possible ways in nature, but highly unlikely. Wow, that's a big deal. This is the private thoughts that Jeremy Farrar was only sharing with Fauci and Collins and Tabak. Okay, number four. Instead of directed engineering, changes in the receptor binding domain, the RBD, and the acquisition of the furin site would be highly compatible with the idea of continued passage of virus in tissue culture. Now, this is exactly the mechanism I proposed way back when because it's the only thing that makes sense, right? This is what you do. And now we have all the data. We see that there were actually um, grant proposals that were written to do exactly this. Let's monkey around with SARS, you know, coronaviruses. Let's take different receptor binding domains and park them onto different backbones. Let's take those, scramble them up, do genetic engineering, put them into cell lines, serial passage them until they do something interesting. Take those and put those resulting lines and put those into animals, passage them until they do something interesting. This is the model. This is, so they knew this. I'm just, I'm just laying the case that they knew this right away. In fact, they knew this months before I got onto it, okay? Um, so I didn't figure this stuff out until I started looking into it in May. So at any rate, let me just do this so it's not there. All right, uh, five, let's go to part five down there. In yellow, acquisition of furin site would likely destabilize the virus, but would make it disseminate to new tissues. So, whoa, -oh, guess what this, this coronavirus does? Unlike almost all other viruses, it doesn't just come in through the ACE2 receptor. We all know about that. It also comes in through the CD147 receptor Ooh, and the neuropillin 1 receptor. And, and, and. It has basically six keys that operate to get into your locked house. That's very unusual. And the furin slight site makes that very specific. So that's what he's saying here. The acquisition of the furin site would destabilize the virus in the sense that it doesn't just go after and attack lung tissue anymore it goes elsewhere, disseminates to other tissues. That's a big problem. So however it got that furin site, whoever put that in there, mm, that was not a good deal. That was a gain of function activity, obviously. In purple, so given above, a likely explanation could be something as simple as passaging SARS-like coronaviruses in tissue culture on human or humanized cell lines under BSL-2 or biological safety laboratory level two for an extended period of time, accidentally creating a virus that would be primed for rapid transmission between humans uh, by a gain of furin site from tissue culture and adaptation to human ACE2 receptor via repeated passage. So, so this is what Mike Farzan is telling to Jeremy Farrar. This is a respected virologist. This, by the way, is everything that makes sense to me. This was the exact mechanism that I had puzzled out on my own, reading a lot of smart people back in the day, but we now know that this is what they were discussing before the United States press had even gotten its head around the idea that this was anything other than, it's just the flu, bro. Remember that? New York Times, Washington Post, all of them were saying early on in early February, saying it's just the flu. Now, February 5th, my Wikipedia page of 12 years got taken down. So already you could tell they were marshalling forces, whoever they are in the story, to make sure that they had complete narrative control over where and how this virus came out and who was reporting on it and what they could say about it. I think it's all somehow connected. So next, all of this brings it back to a simple conversation about how this virus might have gained a furin site. <clears throat> but with a stretch and series of coincidences, you can find a way to explain others, although very odd altogether. And there are ways in which that could occur both in nature and in the lab. Nothing seems to specifically suggest whether this virus was most likely to be adapted, evolved, or maybe even engineered. Uh-oh, smoking gun time here. Quote, so 
I think it becomes a question of how do you put all this together, whether you believe in this series of coincidences, what you know of the lab in Wuhan, how much could be in nature, accidental release or natural event. I am 70-30, maybe 60-40, leaning towards engineered versus natural. This is Jeremy Farrar on February 2nd. After talking with a a virologist said, you know, that fear in sight, really kind of odd. And it stands out like a sore thumb. And now that we we have the full genetic code, we can say it really stands out like a sore thumb. In fact, now that I know what I know, if I was a prominent virologist and I have that code, I just look at it and I go, oh, this thing absolutely was engineered. And I'll show you why in just a second. But they knew this. All right. So this is still from that same email, the big smoking gun. Uh, this is from Jeremy Farrar. This is more reflections continued. All right. So remember... This one up here ends with I am 70, 30, 60, 40. You can see that line at the very top in white. Now from Bob, from somebody named Bob, I'm going to assume that's Bob Gary, but it's an assumption. From Bob, he writes here, quote, before I left the office for the ball, I aligned NCOV with the 96% bat coronavirus sequenced at WIV. I assume that's at TG13. Except for the receptor binding domain, the RBD, the five, the S proteins are essentially identical at the amino acid level. Well, all but the perfect insertion of 12 nucleotides that adds the furin site. Spike protein subset two, S2, is over its whole length essentially identical. I really can't think of a plausible natural scenario where you get from the bad virus or one very similar to it to NCOV where you insert exactly four amino acids, 12 nucleotides that all have to be added at the exact same time to gain this function, and that you don't change any other amino acid in S2. I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature, end quote. Me neither. That's what I was saying at the time. When you see that perfect insert, mutations happen. A T becomes an A, a G becomes a C. That, 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 that's a mutation. An insert is, it's like taking a, a Shakespearean sonnet and cutting it right in the middle of one of the sonnets and separating the, a sentence and inserting four new words in there that doesn't change the meaning upstream or downstream. It's not easy to do. It doesn't just happen. Inserts often are pretty random. So for this perfect little 12 nucleotide four amino acid insert, that is the PRRA amino acid sequence of the furin site. It is the smoking gun. And here we see Bob, assuming presumably Bob Gary saying, I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature. Me neither, right? Carrying on, do the alignment of the spikes at the amino acid level, do the alignment of the spikes at the amino acid level, just do that. It's stunning. Of course, in the lab, it would be easy to generate the perfect 12 base insert that you wanted. Of course, in the lab, it would be easy to generate exactly the insert you wanted. Of course, another scenario is that the progenitor of NCOV was a bat virus with the perfect furin cleavage site generated over evolutionary time. In this scenario, RATG13, the WIV virus was generated by a perfect deletion of 12 nucleotides while essentially not changing any other S2 amino acid, even more implausible, in my opinion. And he's not wrong about that. The odds of that are vanishingly small. So that's the big if. Now, if you were doing gain of function research, you would not use an existing clone of SARS or MERS. These viruses are already human pathogens. What you would want to do, what you would do is, uh, what you would do is a clone Sorry, what you would do is clone a bat virus that they had not that had not yet emerged. Maybe then pass it in human cells for a while to lock in the RBS, and then you reclone it and you put the mutations you're interested in. And da, 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 one of the first polybasic cleavage site. Ta-da! So he's just describing the most plausible thing you can imagine is somebody said. I want to take this thing, I'm going to take little pieces and I'm going to put them together and I'm going to put them in cells and then I'm going to look and I'm going to take a furin's cleavage site, I'm going to tuck it in there. Is this possible? Yes, this has been going on for decades, this exact kind of work. In fact, we're going to talk about who is probably most responsible for that here in the United States because we all know the bat lady. Now, um, I do want to just take a second here to remind everybody that I do all of this 
and I'm supported by subscribers. And of course, I do all of this for subscribers only. I have a whole lot other body of work that's out there. This is a recent testimonial from someone at the site saying, welcome to all the newcomers. We had a uh, sale going on this past week for people to try it out. We had a bunch of newcomers come in and being welcomed by, here we go, saying, I'll be interested to hear your take on this experience. I found the first video series version of the crash course compelling and wanted to know more about whatever this Chris guy was talking about, so I subscribed. Peak Prosperity is invaluable to me because of the depth and breadth of Chris's awareness, his science background, his willingness to stick out like a sore thumb if the data takes him there, and because of the community he has attracted. I will prioritize this subscription because there is nowhere else to get such reliable, to get such reliable information across such a wide spectrum, and because I want Chris and my partner Evie and community to be able to continue this service. Susan. Hey, thank you, Susan. Great testimonial, unsolicited. Uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of people we have and the kind of tribe and community we have at Peak Prosperity. Things are getting weird out there, if you hadn't noticed. So you're going to need your tribe. And if you need a virtual tribe, feeling alone or isolated, come to Peak Prosperity. But my main service is, I'm going to save you time because I'm going to put in the hard work to figure stuff out and read stuff so you can be busy becoming resilient and getting your preparations ready and in order. Um, by the way, part two of this is uh, this. Now it gets serious. A lot of things breaking out there all at once, sort of at the institutional level, our monetary system. Uh-oh, insects disappearing, things like that. We have to talk about dialing up our preparations as if these things were really true, which unfortunately they are. If you can't uh, or don't want to join, I could ask you, Could you could also help maybe by pre-ordering this book of mine that's coming out in February. If you pre-order it, it helps it move up the uh, ladder and maybe we can hit the bestseller list or something like that, which will help more people read it because somehow that, that all works. All right, so that was the smoking gun email we just covered over there, right? <laughs> As of February 2nd, Jeremy Ferrar is saying, oh my gosh, there's a lot of inconsistent things here that, God, you know, at best we have to say lab leak is a serious possibility. As of February 2nd, privately to just the leadership, the top leadership at the NIH and NIAID, Jeremy Farrar is saying 70, 30, maybe 60, 40. I'm leaning towards lab leak, which is actually where the data takes you. Now, Collins weighs in. This is what I had last year. Francis Collins writing back just to Jeremy Farrar, just to Anthony Fauci, just to Lawrence Tabak. This is in response to that email we just went through, which is just a smoking gun. He said, thanks for forwarding these additional reflections from Mike and Bob. B5, B5, uh, FOIA redacted. What he actually said there was, thanks for forwarding these additional reflections from Mike and Bob. I hadn't given much consideration to the idea of lab-based evolution by tissue culture passage, but that's worth including on the list of options. Okay, so as of February 2nd, Sunday, you can see these guys are burning the, the oil on this thing, because, I mean, this thing, as of the 31st, they realized they had a problem Twitter was starting to light up. Articles were starting to be written. We had this really scary uh, piece of uh, uh, research come out from uh, Prashant et al., which said, oh my gosh, not only is this a really weird coronavirus, but it has four inserts that line up almost perfectly or perfectly, depending on which insert, with inserts uh, from pieces of, of amino acid strings that we would see in HIV GP120 protein. So they had to get that. They wanted to just stomp this all down. And so... But Collins, as late as Sunday, February 2nd, was saying, Francis Collins is saying, I hadn't given much thought to this serial passaging in human tissue culture. Why not, dude? This is like, this has been, people have been doing this since before I was born. I mean, this is like, that's a long time ago. So at any rate, this is a thing. And I'm not clear why he hadn't considered that as being a thing, given his position as director of the NIH. So, um... At any rate, carrying on, uh, we see here, uh, I put this one up before, where it's like, I got this big B5, Jerem, uh, sorry, uh, R-A-M, Ron Fouchier, out of Rotterdam. Uh, thanks, a useful teleconference, B5. A lot of gray. So this is what actually he said. Hey, this was a very useful teleconference. Given the evidence presented and the discussions around it, I would conclude that a follow-up discussion on the possible origin of 2019 NCOV would be of much interest. However, 
I doubt if it needs to be done on very short term given the importance of other activities of the scientific community, WHO, other stakeholders at present. It's my opinion that a non-natural origin of 2019 NCOV is highly unlikely at present. Any conspiracy theory can be approached with factual information. So you can see Ron Fouchier was very early on wanting to not just lean towards a natural origin, but he begins to use the conspiracy brush even before you can tell we have any solid data. There's not a lot of data going on here, right? This is early on. People are groping around, but he's already thrown down. It's highly unlikely. And I'm not going to brook any of these wacky conspiracy theories. So this is a, one of those cases of me think the senator doth protest a little too loudly, right? It's, he, this isn't a serious scientist. This is somebody with an axe to grind. He's got a belief system. He's worried about his job, something. But it's not science because there's not a chance in the world a scientist could say anything other than how Jeremy Farrar has is, is placed it at this point. I see this. It could still be that. We don't have enough data. I'm leaning this way more than that way. That's the best you can do. Ron Fauchier threw it down. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, highly unlikely, he says. His notes from that meeting were completely redacted, and now they're completely unredacted. So let's go through Ron's notes from that meeting. <clears throat> he says here in his notes, an accusation that NCOV 2019 might have been engineered and released into the environment by humans, accidental or intentional, would need to be supported by strong data beyond reasonable doubt. Now, why would that have to be beyond reasonable doubt? Um, you can't get that kind of certainty. All you can do is add up what you got, what the probabilities are, but I'm going to show you that Ron then goes completely off the reservation and makes a case not based on strong data and then just throws down with that a ridiculously transparently bad scientist. In fact, if I was part of the leadership of the NIH and I was interested in science and this guy came in with these deeply unscientific opinions, I'd be like, Ron, get out of here. If I want an unqualified opinion where somebody just makes stuff up out of thin air, I'll ask a random person on the street. For now, beat it, right? But at any rate, uh, he says here, uh, it is good that this possibility was discussed in detail with a team of experts. However, further debate about such accusations would unnecessarily distract top researchers from their active duties and do unnecessary harm to science in general and science in China in particular. Now, why? What? <laughs> OK, Ron Fouchier. Why are you on February 2nd, 2020, when there's this emergent threat, your, one of your chief concerns is the harm that might happen to science in China if people discuss the possibility this came out of a lab? What harm to science would there be? Science is only ever availed by and help, helped by people following where the data goes. It's not helped by people like you running interference for China so that they don't get their feelings hurt in this story potentially and take them off of their important scientific duties. At any rate, this is why this guy was, was involved in this and this is why he was invited back and this is why Tony Fauci, I am science, likes this guy because you can see him defending the science. <laughs> Trademark, right? Uh, this is crazy. Anyway, as a, as a scientist, I'm offended by this guy. I mean, offended, all right? But let me take myself out of it again. Uh, all right. And uh, uh, at present, the argument that NCOV-19 uh, would have uh, emerged from an animal source is much stronger than other possibilities. He gave six reasons, observations here. I'm going to just cover a few of them. First, he says, OK, observations about the genome that were inferred to be suggestive, suggestive of a non-animal origin, non-natural reservoir origin or lab origin. HIV-like sequences in the spike protein. Ding, it's true. Uh, level of mutations in the spike protein region, ding, true. Uh, three, presence of a furin cleavage site in the middle of the spike, how to get there, ding, true. A BAMH1 restriction site, I won't cover that, that's for a later episode, very important concept, it's there. An F to Y substitution in the receptor binding domain of the spike, also true, and the potential for O-link glycan sites protecting the cleavage site of the spike. Complicated stuff. We'll get a little gonk wonky here, but I'm just going to cover a couple of these and let's go down and see what he did. Okay, taking this, number one. Remember, number one here was 
HIV-like sequences in the spike protein. Let me dismiss this right away, says Ron Fouchier, Ron, protector of science, Chinese scientists in particular, Fouchier. One, the BioRxiv a preprint server, publication by Prashant, Perdon, and colleagues from Delhi, quote, uncanny similarity of unique inserts in the 2019 NCOV spike protein to HIV, GP120, and GAG, end quote, has already been heavily debated on bio, BioRxiv and virological.org. <laughs> These people had some conflicts of interest, okay? <laughs> like big ones. The similarity between the inserts in 2019 NCOV spike and sequences of HIV is accidental. These are very short insert sequences that are highly similar to many gene bank entries. Such similarities are explained by pure chance alone. Okay, these are a lot of assertions. Ron, pro tip. It's good to have your assertions be backed up by data. So let's go there. I'll provide the context in the data. Unfortunately, I didn't have to do any of the work. Uh, this is a great blog, and that is a very special mouse down there. Arc Medics blog wrote this back in April, a long time ago, said absolute proof the GP120 sequences prove beyond all doubt that COVID-19 was man-made and goes over the Prashant paper um, and says uh, this. So let's look at this. So from Perdon, uh, Prashant et al., this is a table that came out of that. This is what we call by an insert. Remember I told you mutations? Hey, they happen. Inserts? Now those are special. And they have here, these are amino acids. So TNGTKR is a sequence of amino acids that you would find in 2019 NCOV. And you find that exact same sequence here in the HIV GP120 protein. Hmm, that's a little weird. Now we see this HKNNKS sequence, again, perfectly identical across both of these things. Hmm, that's kind of odd. The, the, this is very, very odd. The, the odds of one of those six amino acid sequences, okay, not unthinkable. When you have two of them, now the odds are getting really, really long. And in particular, we move to insert three, which also comes from the GP120 protein where you have this RSYL motif here. And then it goes into this very long TPG DSSSG motif right here. This is again, really, really important. I won't go into all the details, but where it's not just that there are these inserts, but where they are arrayed, they end up on the outside of the spike protein where they can interact with and potentially facilitate binding to the cells. So as we start to unravel how and why we're seeing COVID and also the COVID vaccines, because of their utilization of the spike protein are beginning to mess up certain parts of the immune system. This could be part of the explanation, of course, we deserve to know. And of course, that would take a lot of inquiry, a lot of study, and a lot of back and forth. Some scientists will be right, some will be wrong, but the ball will move generally forward over time if we were looking into it. This we saw Ron Fouchier just saying, I'm gonna shut this down because these are very short insert sequences, highly similar. No, these aren't similar, Ron, to the GP120 protein. They are identical for long stretches. Not similar to other ones that we can find, but identical. Big difference in science world. Um, and he says, such similarities are explained by pure chance alone. So let's let the mouse take it off for us here and say, okay, well, these, this, these six amino acids are encoded by these genetic letters right here. And H -N -K, H -K -N -K -N -N -K S is encoded by this string here. But look at this one, the RSYLTPGDSSG, those amino acids is encoded by this ridiculously long string of letters right here. And by the way, to get it coded by that exact string of letters right there, the chances of that happening is about one in four billion trillion or so. One in four billion trillion. Somehow it pulled it off. So when Ron says, Declaratively, such similarities are explained by pure chance alone. You want this guy buying your Powerball lottery tickets because he doesn't understand math at all, right? He just doesn't understand uh, whatever his, whatever his uh, background is. It does not include a grounding in statistical probabilities, but he's very assertive with it. He was very declarative. So that's how he dismissed number one. Um, and it carries on from there and he dismissed more things. Like, but we'll just cover one more. And his number three argument, he says, quote, that coronaviruses generally 
do not have a furin cleavage site in the spike protein. Some human coronaviruses do have a furin cleavage site in the spike, which must have evolved naturally. As animal reservoir and spillover hosts are highly undersampled, the presence of a furin cleavage site in spike in such a species is unknown. He's like, it could be possible. Maybe we just haven't found it yet, right? This is the hand waving of the worst sort, but he's going to say it declaratively. So this is probably why he got on this team. When coronaviruses jump host barriers, this frequently involved adaptation of cleavage sites that may be targeted by various proteases, given the presence of furin-like sites in human coronaviruses and the mutation of protease cleavage sites. But the, uh, a natural origin of the furin site is certainly not impossible. Whoa, a lot of hand-waving. The problem is he had the genetic code at the time. So we know that this furin cleavage site wasn't just improbable, but it shared a distinct feature that made it vanishingly impossible to consider that it came from a natural origin. Now, I covered that extensively at the time, but very quickly, we'll just go over this again. It's the PRRA. It's this site right here. It's just stuck right in, very stands out, and it has this very, very unique 12 nucleotide sequence. Actually, there's 19 that code here, um, and it, that 19 nucleotide sequence, which includes the 12 in the center, right? here, which most notably includes the CGG, CGG motif. Coronaviruses don't use that. That is used in, in the lab quite a bit, but that CGG, CGG motif is very, very unique. In fact, where else would we find it in the world of nature? And the answer is from Dayu at Dayu15 here on Twitter, replying back in uh, February of 2022. Some people said, oh, we see that, that motif, those 19 nucleotides. We see it couple other places in nature, it's in some bacteria, right? Okay, this doesn't work because it doesn't help that the bacteria have that sequence. They can't pass it to these viruses because these viruses don't interact with bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes. We mammals are in the eukaryote line. Our viruses don't talk to you. They don't do anything. There's no crosstalk. So you can't have a dual infection within a single host. Like a bacteria can't both, you know, have this virus in it and another virus to recombine and then this other virus escapes and comes back out and infects bats and pangolins and snakes and monkeys and humans. It doesn't work that way. So Dayu wrote here, bacteria is not a host of beta coronaviruses or any coronaviruses. They are eukaryotic, eukaryotic only viruses that can't replicate in them. That sequence, the CTC, CTC, GG, CGG, CAC, GTAG sequence is absent in all mammalian transcriptomes, you do not find it in any mammalian cells, except for those that were transfected by Moderna. And it's in the, that exact sequence sits in a Moderna patent. So this is all well known. We've known about this. We've been talking about this for a long time. What are the chances that that's happened by nature? According to Ron Fouchier, uh, it's certainly not impossible for this very strange string of letters to have just randomly landed at this exact spot where the furin cleavage site does the most damage. It's like, no, Ron, you're right. It's certainly not impossible, but it's vanishingly improbable. And of course you knew that. And you knew that at the time, all of his arguments were just junk, uh, basically. And so they amount to junk. However, we got to carry on so we can get through this. February 2nd, though, I want to note that doubt still exists. This was, uh, they deleted still here under B6, which is protecting privacy. Who this is from, they deleted, but it was signed Andrew almost positively, this has got to be Andrew Rambeau writing this. As of February 2nd, Andrew is still writing at this point in time, and his name is important because I'll show you what he comes up again. Andrew Rambeau here, I think, but Andrew is writing, Dear Jeremy, Ron, and all, thanks for inviting me on the call yesterday. I'm also agnostic on this. I do not have any experience of laboratory virology. I don't really know what's likely or not in that context. From a natural evolutionary point of view, the only thing here that strikes me as unusual is the furin cleavage site. It strongly suggests to me that we are missing something important in the origin of this virus. My inclination would be that it is a missing host species in which this feature arose because it was selected for in that host. We can see this insertion has resulted in an extremely fit virus in humans. We can also deduce that it is not optimal for transmission in bat species. Why? Because they don't have this particular um, enzyme, the furin protease, right? So 
to, to operate it in this way. So this is Andrew Rambeau. As of February 2nd going, me? Seems unlikely. I could imagine some ways it might have happened, but again, you can see the gray. He's not throwing down 100% one way like Ron was. He's kind of where Jeremy Ferrar is. As of Sunday, February 2nd, like, could have been, I don't know, but it's kind of weird. You got to admit, it's a little weird how this, how'd that Fuhrer and Cleavage site get there. All right. So that's, that's uh, an Andrew um, carrying on the director of the NAH here. By the way, on Sunday, February 2nd, notice Francis Collins is writing only to Jeremy Farrar, copying in only Anthony Fauci and Lawrence Tabak here, saying, Jeremy, though the arguments from Ron Fouchier and Christian Drosten are presented with more forcefulness than necessary, so I skipped an email from Christian Drosten, just like Ron Fouchier, just coming down hard that this has to only have come from, you know, natural origin, despite not really having the data to make that. So uh, very diplomatically, Francis Collins says, though the arguments from Ron and Christian are presented with more forcefulness than necessary, I'm coming around to the view that a natural origin is more likely. But I share your view that a swing, a swift convening of experts in a confidence-inspiring framework, the WHO really seems the only option, is needed or the voices of conspiracy will quickly dominate, doing great potential harm to science and international harmony. So Francis has lost the plot line again, where he is director of the preeminent science organization in the United States. He's concerning himself with international harmony and some sort of reputational harm to science, which of course has now been shattered due to his inept leadership actually creating all of these questions and hiding and not being transparent and fundamentally fudging everything and creating this particular storm that we are now in. So thank you, Francis Collins, for wrecking science for a whole generation of people. I mean, good work there, buddy. Uh, this was bad. So he should not be concerning himself with damping down the voices of conspiracy. What, what, what's it, how, are, how is this already in, what's a conspiracy? P-R-R-A, where to come from? That is a murder mystery. It's not a conspiracy. That's how we should be looking at it. It's a scientific conundrum that we would like to see we, we can uh, resolve in some way. All right. As of February 4th, doubts still exist. Okay. Doubts are still there. Jeremy Farrar, Tuesday, February 4th, says, hmm, being very careful in the morning wording. Again, notice this is only going to Francis Collins, only going to Anthony Fauci. Nobody else is on this. None of those other... Ron, no Ron Fauchier's on here, no uh, Rambos, no Holmes, no Andersons, none of them. We just, just Farrar, some dude that belongs to an NGO out there, huh? you might ask some questions about why is it that the top two people at the NIH and NAID are only conversing with Jeremy Farrar about this, like what do we do with this data, right? Interesting, interesting thing to talk about. Um, as they're not talking with their medical or or political equivalents in the UK, in France, in anywhere else. They're talking with this guy, Jeremy Farrar. I'll save that for another day. Jeremy writes, quote, being very careful in the morning wording here, uh, I added the word here, in the morning wording, engineered, probably not, remains very real possibility of accidental lab passage in animals to give the glycan, something I didn't talk about, but it's a, it's a chemical signature, on the virus that says, oh, this probably, this had to come through an animal model at some point. So accidental lab passage in animals to give glycans, it's still a possibility he's talking about it here, which is actually, thank you, um, for our, because it's true. Will Ford immediately, or if you want, give Eddie Holmes a ring. Eddie would be 60-40 lab side. Eddie's 60-40 lab side as of February 4th, according to Jeremy Farrar. I remain 50-50. Collins writes back, very thoughtful analysis. I note that Eddie is now arguing against the idea that this is a product of intentional human engineering. But repeated tissue culture passage is still an option though, right? But it doesn't explain the O-link glycans. Francis. So I'm getting the idea here that Francis actually doesn't know squat about virology or how viruses are done or lab work or anything like that because he doesn't understand the O-link glycans. Those would clearly come through passage in an animal model. That's easy. He could have found that out in 10 minutes on Google. So, so uh, Francis is looped in, I think, because he's the top dog in this story, but he clearly doesn't, you know, what he says about where this may or may not have come from carries a lot less weight with me because he seems to be confused by very basic things such as tissue culture passaging and 
where the O-link glycans come from in animal models and all that. But as of February 4th, there are still doubts in here, right? Eddie 6040, I'm 50-50, right? That's at 6.08 in the morning. By 10.58, Francis is saying, well, you know, I think Eddie's like arguing now more towards natural. Okay. But notice what happened here on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, February 4th. Christian Anderson writing to Peter Dazak of EcoHealth Alliance, probably the person most responsible for having helped the WIV gain all the knowledge they could about creating coronaviruses exactly like this one, the one we're talking about right now. As well, look at all the other people that have been copied in here, including Ralph Barrick, Trevor Bedford, um, we got Gigi in here, we got Tom Inglesby, we got Stanley Perlman. Um, these, all these names will show up again elsewhere. But note here, Christian Anderson on Tuesday writing, reading through the letter, and this is a letter that's now being crafted to send out to the world to say natural origin, right? Reading through the letter, I think it's great, but I, I do wonder if we need to be more firm on the question of engineering. The main crackpot theories going around at the moment relate to this virus being somehow engineered with intent, and that is demonstrably not the case. Engineering can mean many things. It could be done for either basic research or nefarious reasons, but the data conclusively show that neither was done. Now, this is February 4th. He's in all those emails, and he's talking with people who are saying conclusively, like, I don't know, buddy. I'm still 60-40. This could be any old thing. We don't know. There's a lot of weirdness here. But out in public, and this is a very public email because this went out to a lot of big big people out in the virology thing, but it went to Peter Dazak in particular from Christian Anderson. And Christian is saying, crackpot theories, 100%. We are conclusively sure that this did not come out of a lab. Now, he can't say that. And obviously, the, the people who are most in the know are also saying 60-40, 50-50, a little bit of a coin flip, but Christian has thrown down, that's on the 4th, and he's declared which way he's going in this particular story. Now, this is the first draft of the proximal origin paper that showed up in Nature, and by the way, Eddie Holmes drafted the first uh, draft of this, or at least he had the first draft, I don't know who he might have cycled that with beforehand, and it comes in to Jeremy Farrar again, uh, who seems to be the, the center of all of this coordinating activity on February 4th, um, and it says, here's our summary so far, will be edited further, and there it is down there. So on February 4th, they already had a paper in full form, it goes on and on and on down there, saying, we, we're, we're pretty sure this only came from a natural origin. So this is the first draft that they came up with, but remember on February 4th, we still had uh, Francis was a little unsure, and we had um, Jeremy Farrar still, oops, nope, not that one. Jeremy Farrar is very unsure. Look at this. February 4th, Jeremy Farrar. I don't know. Fitty fitty, right? But this draft comes out right away that says, eh, this thing came from nature. No, it couldn't have come from a lab. So what does Farrar do? Well, he says, very short, punctual email. I like the pithy emails. Tidied up. He says, so he tidied up that draft that Eddie Holmes had sent. But notice when he tidied it up, he sent the tidied up version not back to the author. Eddie Holmes did not get that version back. He tidied it up and sent it to Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci. That's kind of an interesting thing. You don't actually give your tidied up version back to the author. You send it to the head of the NIH and the head of the NIAID. I know where I would be poking in further if I was doing an investigation into this with some sort of subpoena power or something like that, because that is a bit odd. Now, Jeremy Farrar on Wednesday, February 5th. Here we are. And he actually seems to be a curious fellow, so I'm going to cut him some slack here because he's still trying to go, uh, you know, at least in these emails. But again, here we're only talking now with Francis Collins, Anthony Fauci, and the author of that paper, Eddie Holmes. Uh, so he says, Tony and Francis, the revised draft from Eddie, copied here. I asked Eddie about the addition of the glycans and where... These could be added accidentally by passage in lab animals uh, or, of course, in the wild. In the reply from both Bob and Christian, uh, Christian said that's correct about everything he said for the pea residue. What's shifted me to thinking that the insert of the furin site is a result of cell culture passage or less likely intense transmission in a non-bat host. Really need to see the data from Ron about engineering the furin cleavage site on in vitro passage, really. Whoa, wait a minute. 
I thought Christian just told every, the whole world out there on February 4th he was slam dunk. There's no evidence for lab passage here or lab creation. And here he's saying the opposite, at least reflected through Jeremy Farrar and his recollections of conversations on the 5th of February. Oh, how about this? Coronavirus has come with or without a furin site. Coronavirus without a furin site are said to be non-cleaved and rely on endosomal proteases like cathepsin for entry. However, if you infect a virus like SARS in culture in the presence of an exogenous protease like trypsin, it's a hundred times more effective at entering because the spike gets cleaved and it can enter the cell surface. So even here on the fifth, they're going, uh, this furin cleavage site seems really important. And the fact that it's a human targeted furin cleavage site seems especially important here. In yellow, you have to infect flu viruses, the ones without the multi-basic cleavage site in the presence of trypsin, which is a, um, a protease and include trypsin in the overlay if you want the virus to spread, saying, hey, look, we know this about viruses. They like the proteases. They like the furin cleavage sites. They like the furin cleavage site plus the cleaver, which is the protease. You put all that in, you get a much more better gain of function uh, virus. A quote, bottom line, I think if you put selection pressure on a coronavirus without a furin cleavage site in cell culture, you could well generate a furin cleavage site after a number of passages. But let's see the data, Ron. So Ron is in charge of the data for this stuff. And guess what? Ron has no interest in sharing that data because Ron only wants this to come from nature. And he's sure of it, even though he doesn't understand basic statistics, math, or how some basic uh, pieces of biology seem to work. It will infect a lot better if it can effectively fuse at the cell surface, doesn't have to rely on endosomal cleavage, blah, blah, blah. All right. This is February 5th. We're still a little unsure here. Uh, Jeremy Farrar is doing a good job saying, hey, you know, it could still be this, could still be that. And of course, we would all want to know that is the honest way you would go forward with this. But this is the same Jeremy Farrar who also tidied up that draft that's like said, well, you know, this thing probably only came from nature. That's the only place it could have really come from. Now, this is where it gets really smoking. February 7th, the draft, again, a revised draft summary, February 7th. So they're still working on it, again, from Jeremy Farrar, again, only to Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci. So Farrar works on the draft, kicks it off to the big guns. They take a look at it. I don't know what happens to it after that because we don't have any emails coming back. If I was investigating, I'd be interested. Did we get all the emails? Because I showed you one earlier that seems to be missing from this chain. So I bet you anything there's missing emails in here. But at any rate, we, that's what we get here. That's kind of intriguing that it happens that way. Now, on the 8th of February, Jeremy Farrar still has questions. Notice who he's copied in here now. This time he's got Andrew Rambeau on there, Patrick Valence, and Josie Golding, and Mike Ferguson. So what we really have now in this one, in Eddie Holmes, this is just a bunch of virologists and a bunch of people who work at Wellcome Trust and or Patrick Valence there, who's um, out of the UK. So this is a very different email. It's not going now to the NIH top brass. Things have been a little cooked through, but Jeremy wants to communicate something and he kicks this out and says, apologies with all correct emails this time. Christian, Andrew, Bob, Eddie have reworked the summary and it's attached here. We are pushing to get the sequence data from the reports on pangolins, because that was a late thing that broke right around this time, but do not have currently, clearly that's, an, that's very important to incorporate Turned out it wasn't. Pangolins are close, but there's no way they could have been part of the story. So that was just, that was a, uh, that, that didn't help out. Interested in your views. Is, it, is this reasonably balanced given the data? Is there anything anyone disagrees with? Is there anything more in relation to what would seem to be the two possibilities he's servicing on February 8th? Two possibilities. Nature intermediate host evolution. That's the natural side of things. Or passage. And, you know, the passaging is passaging on cells and in animals in a lab. So was it nature, two possibilities, or lab? Nature or lab? As of February 8th, there were still two possibilities floating around, and he's very fairly asking, is this a good representation? Is this how we want to see this? Is this what we're going to do? And finally, advice on whether Christian Anderson, Andrew Rambeau, um, RG, and EH should, should, should publish this thing. Well... The answer is yes, apparently, because on February 9th, the very next day, the paper has now already been published in Nature articles. And by the way, this got uh, cited like, I forget how many times. 
um, tens of thousands of times. Th this article was was uh, was uh, d I think downloaded two hundred thousand times. I believe it was cited over twenty nine hundred times. I think that's the right numbers. At any rate, this article had a huge splash. The proximal origin of SARS CoV two. Who's on there? Christian Anderson, Andrew Rambo, Ian Lipkin, Eddie Holmes. R.G., Robert Gary, all people except for Ian Lipkin, who is surprisingly missing from these emails. He's on this paper here, but everybody else was in all of the emails we just looked at. These are the people who on February 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, were still like, and then on the 8th, and uh, somewhere between the 8th, it must have been on the 8th, they must have flipped because on the 9th, this was submitted. This paper was submitted after being tidied up, and it says conclusively this thing had to come from nature. And that was the story they're running with. So that's kind of intriguing. Now, what happens if, like, you're a lead author on this thing, Christian Anderson, and you've done good work, and, and you've done what Tony wants? Well, of course, Tony rewards you because we live in a highly corrupt system. Look at this. A new NIAID-funded center announced on August 27, 2020. It's an $8.9 million grant to the Anderson Lab at Scripps Research Institute. Five-year grant awarded by the NIAID here to Christian Anderson. 8.9 million, that's a big grant. Also totally inconsequential given the damage done to the world by this particular virus. So that's how the game is played. If you play the game, you might get well-funded. And if you don't play the game, well, you'll probably have your channels all suppressed a little bit and maybe you'll have your Wikipedia page taken down and maybe no journalist will actually call you from a major newspaper to find out what you think about things. That's what happens when you don't play the game. I'm happy to be here with you playing this game instead because we get to keep our integrity. Christian Anderson, there he is. Lovable guy, obviously, famously thin-skinned. Blocked me a long time ago. Blocks people all over the place because the one thing a scientist hates is being questioned on their core data and having to defend their arguments. Oh no, wait, that's not a scientist. That's just a thin-skinned person. All right, so uh, remember this, the Lancet too. They also in March 7th of 2020, this is right in the context of this, February then March, here we are. There was this huge thing that said, statement in support of the scientists, public health professionals and medical professionals of China combating COVID-19. What an embarrassing moment. All these scientists here putting their name down on a, on a letter into the Lancet, basically saying these conspiracy questions asking if this came from a lab are really unfortunate and they damage our medical professionals in China combating COVID-19. Like, why? What is this is an odd thing that's going on right here. At any rate, if we look down this list really quick, you'll see there's Jeremy Farr, there's Josie Golding, there's Christian Drosten, there's Mike Turner. These uh, All the people in yellow are uh, welcome trust people. Again, here they are. They seem to care a lot about how viruses in China come together. And as well, there's a lot of other names on here that I can show you that were actually in all of these emails. But you know what? You know what? What's interesting to me is not who is on here. What's interesting to me is who is not on here and all those other emails because they said, oh, we assembled the world's best leading team of people who understand these sorts of things best, right? Actually not. So let's check this out. You know what's not in these emails, any of them? There's no mention of any known early treatments that surfaced during SARS. So this is classic SARS back in 2003. There were certain things I can show you papers from the NIH that said, wow, we found some early treatments for that seem to work against SARS, classic SARS. I'm not talking COVID. I mean, the original SARS, but they're kind of related. So you might think, hey, this is a starting point. We should look into these things early and fast. If your goal was it's January, you see this thing is coming. I think you'd want to go, hey, all my scientists inside NIH and NAAD, could you please look back and find out what we did during SARS and get back to me with everything that was known to be effective? They didn't do that. And because one of the things that they found, interestingly, back in 2003, actually, I think the discovery came in 2005, but they were still messing around with SARS to say, like, how would we treat this? It comes in through those endosomes, right? It comes into a cell. You know what else goes into endosomes? Hydroxychloroquine, because that's where the um, plasmodium falciparum, the, the, the malaria parasite comes in through the same endosomes and, and hydroxychloroquine messes up the pH of those endosomes and it messes up the life cycle of malaria as well as SARS. 
So it's kind of interesting. So that would have been an interesting starting point to say, hey, we already know this works. Let's try it. Let's kick out some trials early on. Let's get that information back to China. Let's see what we can do. None of that happened in these emails. So that that's one thing that didn't happen. You know what else didn't happen? There was no inclusion of a certain individual named Ralph Barrick of UNC in the email chains, despite him being literally number one, hands down, the expert, not just in coronaviruses, but chimeric lab created coronaviruses, hands down, nobody in the world with more data and information on that than this guy. So if they'd had Ralph Barrick in those email chains, he could have set Francis Collins straight like that. Now, why wasn't he included in these things? Well, they say, You never ask a question that you don't want the answer to. I think there's a pretty good reason that Ralph was left off these email chains and it wasn't because nobody thought of him. He is clearly, he literally wrote the book on chimeric coronavirus creation. Kind of the guy. As well, Peter Daszak, missing. Also, very notably absent. Remember, it's not what's there. Sometimes it's also what's not there. These two stand out like a sore pair of thumbs not in these email chains. So that was kind of interesting. And as well, no mention of the fact that EcoHealth Alliance had been funding the Wuhan Institute of Virology and had been done so by NIH and NIAID. No mention of any of that in here, except for one panicky little email from Fauci uh, on January, uh, I think it was 29th, might've been 30th. Anyway, right at the end of January there saying, oh no, look at this 2015 paper by Barrick and she the bat lady out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, they were very concerned about that one because they were talking about doing exactly the kinds of experiments that would have led to potentially the eruption of a lab escape or lab creation virus. And so that was the only mention of that, but then that disappears entirely from these email records. And of course they were either scrubbed or people were careful enough to know that you never put that kind of stuff down in emails, but it's notable for its absence, because if this was honest above board, I would imagine there would be plenty of email inquiry around that going, oh, hey, kind of weird that we did this. What's our exposure here? Did we in any way contribute to this? Look into this, please get back to me with some answers. That would have been honest. The fact that it's completely missing from these emails speaks to a level of professional dishonesty to me within the NIH structure. All right, Um, and there's no mention of the fact that DARPA the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, they rejected a crazy EcoHealth Alliance funding request. Uh, it, was, it was very crazy. I'll go into that some other time. I've gone into it in the past. It's nutty. But basically, EcoHealth Alliance under Peter Dazak said, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if we took a lot of random backbones that aren't normally used for gain of function of coronaviruses and put a whole bunch of new spike proteins on them, gave them human optimized furin cleavage sites, gave them O-linked glycan residues and N-linked glycan residues and did a bunch of other things and serial passage them in cell culture and then serial passage them in mice that have been humanized. Wouldn't that be a cool thing to do? And DARPA was like, get out of here with that. They're like, we're not funding that. That's crazy gain of function stuff. But that was back in 2015, I believe, or eight, no, 2018 for sure. Yeah, 2018. Anyway, so if somebody says they can do something and then it happens, you have to include in the possibility set that maybe they did it, right? That's how I think at any rate. It's completely notably obvious that none of that was being surfaced here by any of these people and they were all in a position to know. And they didn't. So that means they didn't wanna know. All right, so those are some interesting things that came from that side. So the bottom line summary here is that, look, we had a small team of people. There was no more than like 10 core people on this proximal origin. It came from Nature paper. They worked tirelessly around the clock from January 31st through about February 9th, right? And they worked hard to cram the facts that were coming out into this narrative and then suppressing any other facts and figures out there who were saying something alternative to the narrative they wanted to promote. They declared things declaratively that were just flat out not true, that they could not declare. They would have had to have said if they were good scientists or even not unreasonable people, they would have said, you know, I think this is more likely, but this has to be considered too. They were like, no, no, you're a crackpot theory conspiracy dude if you think it was anything other than nature. Uh, the redactions that, did, that were performed are highly damning who performed those redactions, it was clearly inappropriate. There is no guarantee of privacy between a 
individual who emails a government agency. It's all open to public record. And of course, you had to go through two layers of FOIA to get these particular records out. Now we have them and now we see why they wanted to do those redactions because February 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, there were open questions, but on the 9th, all those questions had been resolved <laughs> and it was natural origin only. And that was the narrative they were rolling with. This looks, smells, feels, tastes like a lot of guilty people trying to CYA in this particular story. They were trying to cover your A's in this story. All right. Um, so this whole narrative of expert virologists look carefully, you could not find any evidence of lab manipulation. That's now completely shredded. That was obvious lies. Anybody who was saying that or promoting that narrative was flat out lying because A, they didn't even have the top expert virologists they should have consulted and B, they found lots of evidence of lab manipulation, but they chose to ignore it or explain it away or otherwise minimize it. And um, uh, obviously that doesn't fit this narrative. So that's broken, that's dead, dead in the water. Lies, they told lies and then they told them and retold them by the same people over and over and over again. That's what we've been treated to this whole time. The mainstream media still will only ask these same experts what they think about everything for their insights into what happened. And of course, that's like asking OJ Simpson what really happened that night, right? It's just, it's, they're not, it's not credible. It's, it's really not credible for the mainstream media to keep on with this fiction and all these lies. And it's not credible to go back to these people. Listen, you have to understand the role of incentives in shaping human behavior and motivations, right? How do we forget this suddenly when it gets to virologists? We're just like, oh no, they must, they're scientists. It's, uh, it's awful. Anyway, uh, Every single one of the scientists, and I need not one set of quotes, but two sets of quotes uh, involved in this cover up, and that's what it was, stood to gain if they played along and to potentially lose everything if they played fair with the data. Because guess what? Reasonable people might have said, oh, there's a chance you all created this because you were all like having fun, earning good salaries, going to conferences and monkeying around with things you clearly couldn't control. Because the best, the best case here is it accidentally escaped. But whether it was accidental or intentional, leaving any of the motivations out of this, it doesn't matter. We can clearly say under either of those scenarios, it didn't make sense for these people to be performing that work. We should stop all of that work. And they didn't want that to happen because, of course, they spent their whole lives and all their ego and their sense of power and importance are all wrapped up in continuing on with their jobs. So we got that, right? That's why you have to have independent commissions, independent people looking into these things. You can't ask the people whose livelihoods will be shredded by one particular answer to look at this fairly. That's just life. Okay, so with all of that, here's what we know. Well, they lied, we know that. And they know now that we know that they lied, right? Actually, I gotta go to Scholzenitzen on, on this one here. So um, uh, he said, we know they're lying. Uh, they know they're lying, uh, and they know that we know that they're lying, and we know that they know that we know that they're lying, but still, they're lying. That's what this is. I titled this Lying Virologist back in 2020. I did it again in 2021. Here I am doing it one more time in 2022. These people have been lying to us. We deserve the real answers, and we should get them. And that is my hope and why I produce anything like this. So let's go forward with that. Now, I've got to close out here. I've got to tell you, I'm going over to Peak Prosperity now. We're going to talk to my members because now it gets serious. This whole story about what just happened with our lying virologists and broken NIH and broken NAAD and, you know, sh you know stupid little bureaucrats doing stuff they shouldn't. It's all ego and blah, blah, blah. That's just one corner of the story. There are lots of things from monetary policy, energy policy, what's going on geopolitically all across the landscape that say it's, come on, it's serious. So we're gonna talk about that, and how to become resilient, steps we can take, but most importantly, we're a community of people. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk about these things like adults, use our common sense, and we're gonna figure out what we do next as a team. So if you wanna be part of that team, come on by Peak Prosperity, sign up, and we'd be thrilled to have you there. All right, that's it. That's what I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this podcast uh, presentation. And I hope it stays up. Thank you very much.